shall we make a start then? I mean, it's roughly shall have been enough time for everyone to join. So let's get cracking. So hi all and welcome to tonight's event, the first event of term between the Oxford Law Society and the Oxford Bar Society. So I'm Athena and I'm the president of the Oxford Bar Society. And with me tonight is Alex, who's with the Oxford Law Society. And we're really excited to have you all here for our introduction to the bar event, which we hope will provide an insight into the bar as a profession, as we hear from four practicing barristers. So joining us tonight will be Mark Davies from Six Pump Court, Madeline Dixon from Enterprise Chambers, Emily Wilsden from Temple Garden Chambers, and Hank Sway from One Chancery Lane. So thank you to all of our speakers for joining us tonight. And I think I will leave them to introduce themselves briefly if we start with Mark. Sure, very happy to. Um, thank you very much for having me, Athena and, um, and Alex. Um, very briefly then, as you've heard, I'm a barrister at Six Pump Court. I was called in 2017, just before I started my second six. So I've been in practice for almost four years. Um, I'd be given a set of questions to, to run through um, in answering tonight, and I'll do that quite briefly, um, keep it as brief as I can so we've got time for questions at the end. So the first one I've got is, is why the bar and not um, a solicitor? And the simple answer is uh, I've got a lot of friends who became solicitors after their degrees um, before I started my qualification, and they seem to spend quite a lot of their time in the early years filling in forms. And that, I'm afraid, didn't strike me as particularly much fun. Um, I also, um, as I'm sure everyone will say, enjoy the advocacy aspect of the bar. Uh, second one is the differences between law firms and chambers. Um, and I actually spent two years working as a paralegal before doing the bar course. So I've got a fair, a fair insight into what law firms are like. And they are, frankly, chalk and cheese, I suspect, unless you're at a very small, either high street or boutique law firm. Um, chambers are collections of individuals. Um, my chambers, for example, has about 55 members. Some of them live in far-flung parts of the country and maybe come into chambers in London once a year, once in a blue moon. Um, whereas in law firms, you know, you're expected to work in teams and it's much more sort of um, collaborative in that, that respect. Not that barrister chambers aren't a very collegiate atmosphere, but um, you are very much um, on your own, and that's a that's a real key and, and principal difference. Um, which probably leads me on actually to, to one other point to, to make clear and that everyone should understand and hopefully already does, which is that um, most barristers, I think about 85% of us are, are self-employed. Um, and that's how you get that collection of individuals and chambers. So all 55 members of my chambers are self-employed um, and we share overheads and those overheads are typically related to the costs of a building and um, the cost of employing staff like the clerks, etc. Um, so that's your sort of real principal difference between the two model of partnership for solicitors and model of self-employed people for chambers. Um, how did I get to where I am? Oh, uh, Mark, I'm really sorry. Do you mind if I just interrupt you there? Because I think sure. I was, we could um, discuss those questions as a panel after we introduce the rest. Is that right? Oh, sorry, I do beg your pardon. In that case, yeah, I will shut up and um, we can, you can introduce everyone else or they can introduce <laughs> themselves. Do it first. That's all right. I think I could have made it clear at the beginning, so that's my bad as well. Um, I think if we go on to Madeline, if you can please introduce yourselves as well. Ron, thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm a barrister at Enterprise Chambers, as Athena has said. Um, I was called in 2013, which was the year when I did my pupillage, um, and I started practice in 2014. Um, I didn't start from a law degree. I studied philosophy first, and then I did a law conversion course. Um, and I specialise now in commercial chancery work. So what that means is um, general contractual disputes, some company and some partnership disputes, insolvency and property. So that's a kind of flavor of the work that I do. And that's pretty typical of, of what we do in chambers. Um, so that's my brief introduction. Cool. Thank you, Madeline. And if we move on to Hank. 
Hey everyone, yeah, so, so my name is Hank Suda. I'm a barrister at One Chancery Lane Chambers. I was taken on the, as a tenant fairly recently, so October 2020. And, and I, I, my second sex pupil is intersected, unfortunately, with the pandemic, which was a, a bit of a nightmare. Uh, I, I specialise at them. I've got a fairly broad practice at the moment, uh, particularly given how junior I am. Uh, and I do personal injury, clinical negligence, public authority liability, travel law, uh, private international law and, and property. Uh, and that makes up the bulk of my, my work at the moment. Great, thank you. And finally, Emily. Hi, so I'm at Temple Garden Chambers. I was called in 2011 and I did my pupillage uh, from 2011 to 2012 at Temple Garden Chambers. Um, I started with a very mixed practice covering lots of different chambers areas. So lots of PI, small PI work, um, a whole variety of odd bits and bobs that came in and um, uh, whatever public law I could pick up. Um, I'm now a member of the Attorney General's panel. So that is the way in which government um, selects the barristers that it instructs. So they have a, a C, a B and an A panel, and then they have silks. So you apply to these. Um, and as a result of that, I know I'm very busy with about 95% government work. And I specialize nowadays um, mostly in inquests, inquiries, um, immigration, judicial review, and other odd related work to that and national security. Um, but again, it started out very varied. Um, and I have had weeks where I've consulted tax, criminal damages, and public law practitioners textbooks. Um, so, but it's slowly, slowly starting to specialize. Great, thank you all for introducing yourselves and it was great to hear about your background. So I think we'll move on to panel discussion on a couple of the questions that I had sent over. And for the audience, if you have any questions, please do put it in the chat and we will move on to those after we finish the panel discussion. So the first thing I wanted to ask, and I think Mark's begin touching on it, is what made you want to become a barrister as opposed to go down the solicitor route? Um, so I will answer this one, I'll let someone else take this. Sorry about that. <laughs> And um, I have not yet uh, muted myself, so I'll go for it. Um, I never considered being a solicitor. Um, I wouldn't see them as two alternatives to choose between um, necessarily, because I think that they require quite different skill sets. And depending on the area of law, they both differ a lot, but very different, might be suited to very different personalities and things you like and dislike, very different ways of working. Um, I, if I hadn't decided to be a barrister, I probably would have done something non-law. Um, but I, I wanted the independence of um, self-employment and the advocacy and the variety um, and the freedom to book my holidays whenever I want them. So actually, I, I, I entirely agree with um, what Emily says. I, I, I wasn't personally choosing between the bar and the solicitor route. And like Emily, if uh, I, I didn't opt for the bar route, I would have done something non-law. Um, Again, as Emily says, I think they are very different jobs. They require very, two very different skill sets. And for me, the main reason I opted for the bar as opposed to an alternative career is the independence, but, but also the advocacy. And that was a, a really central factor for me. Uh, I think it's a really exciting part of the job. And it, it's quite unique to the, to the bar, barrister profession. Um, and, and that really was the main reason why, why I opted for the barrister route. Um, I'll cut in as, uh, from there. Um, I think when I was starting out, um, partly because I, I didn't do law at undergrad, so I think I knew slightly less about it until later, I did see them as two alternative jobs. And it wasn't until I'd done some work experience that uh, I realised how different they were. I think my perception from the work experience that I did was that um, if you're a solicitor, it's much more of a collaborative job, as I think Mark said, um, it's much more client facing um, and, and so more about sort of you know, building up relationships with particular clients over time, um, helping them to solve their problems, but not necessarily from a legal perspective. So softer skills like 
negotiation um, might be more important. What, what really attracted me to the bar was the independence, as I think everyone else has said, the advocacy, um, but also I thought there would be greater opportunity to engage with the law as, as a sort of intellectual problem. So if, if you're advising, you kind of really get into the into the nitty gritty of it. Um, and I, I don't think that you have the opportunity to do that to as great an extent as a solicitor, um, because you just don't have time. That's not the nature of your job. And if there's something that's really difficult or problematic, you would probably send it to counsel to advise anyway. So that that's an additional factor that I took into account when I was deciding on which to choose. Um, great, thank you. Um, you've all touched on one really important um, differential aspect between the bar and the solicitor route, and that's the independence of it. Um, if you guys could build on that a little bit and uh, explain some of the main differences between um, chambers and law firms, I think that would um, be helpful for some people who are less familiar with um, the differences and why there is more independence. Um, um, Madeline, since you since you were um, specifically talking about that just just earlier, maybe you could start. Yes, uh, well, I think being self-employed does make a, a massive difference. Um, Mark gave a really, really clear explanation of the structure of chambers or, or the vast majority of chambers, you are a collection of individuals, you're not one entity. Um, that doesn't mean that you have no connection with each other at all. Chambers will tend to do the same sort of, of work. So, you know, all of my colleagues specialise broadly in um, commercial chancery and um, we all speak to each other and communicate with each other about our cases but I think that the major difference is because you're self-employed you have a lot of freedom to carve out your own career so that can be the amount of work you do the type of work that you do within your particular field or if you want to branch out to different fields um, you can do that um, within a chambers um, and it it also has an effect on, on the I would say the level of responsibility that you have from a very early stage um, again this will depend on which chambers you go to because if you're at for example a very big commercial set you might find that you're one of a team of counsel um, and you're the most junior member of the team when you're starting out and that means that you don't have a great deal of independence um, but certainly for my sort of work because a lot of the work that I do isn't led by silks it means that I was sort of from the very first day of my career advising on cases and having full responsibility um, appearing in court by myself uh, making strategic decisions about how you run a case and that sort of independence I think is really valuable and I, I really enjoy it um, that yeah, doesn't mean there are no court. downsides I'm still here. Um, because you know for instance you know that level of responsibility can be stressful when it's your first day in practice and you're being asked to advise a partner who's been in practice for 20 years about a particular point but I really like it and it, it works very well for me. So that, that I would say is a major difference. I can actually expand on, on one point Emily says, um, Emily mentioned there. So obviously I'm, I'm only recently a tenant and, and I can remember the first advice I was asked to do uh, on, my, my, on my own behalf. Uh, and on this independence point, you quickly, no one's there to check over your advice. If you get it wrong, that's down to you. There's no one to hide behind. Uh, and often important decisions are going to be made on the basis of your advice. Uh, and 
that's simultaneously quite empowering, but but also quite stressful. And, and I've had previous jobs before where you know your work's checked over by multiple people up the the corporate hierarchy, as it were, um, and you're kind of subsumed within this big bureaucracy. Uh, and the bar is the complete opposite to that. Um, and and that's de definitely a very attractive part. And I suppose that's a slight digression from the question of, of why the bar is independent, but um, yeah. I still remember as well <laughs> the feeling because it's very bizarre. You go from pupillage, which is very um, intensely supervised. Even when you start doing your own work, you're on your pupil supervisor's insurance and you run everything mm. by them. You're in the room with them. And then, I mean, it was a very minor advice, but you're in a, your own room, potentially by yourself, <laughs> with your own desk, which you've possibly had to buy yourself, your own chair. Again, you've probably had to buy yourself. Um, and yes, you submit a piece of work and you give your opinion and somebody's actually paying for it um, and nobody is checking it. Um, but you, you do get used to it relatively quickly. Um, the differences between chambers and law firms, I would also say is uh, that chambers are much smaller organizations in general, um, and they differ from anything between 10 people to, I guess, I don't know how big the biggest are, maybe 200 at the very, very biggest. We're se about 75 now, I think. Um, there's definitely a much more collegiate feel about the bar. Um, you're not directly competing against each other for promotion or anything like that. Um, although everyone's sort of, you know, aware of the hierarchy and you've got, you know, people with positions in chambers helping to run it or um, uh, people are more or less senior. Um, but that's no one's going to, you know, submit feedback on you for some annual review. Um, so you can have a much more equal relationship with other members of chambers than you might have with colleagues in a law firm. And um, I say this as someone who's barely stepped foot in a law firm. Um, the other difference is, and there's a lot of practical differences in being self-employed that aren't unique to the bar that you should consider whether they would suit you. So yes, you have complete freedom in some senses over your diary. Um, maybe not somewhere like the criminal bar, where I think people tend to have you know, trials might overrun and they have to cancel holidays. I've never had to do that at the civil and public law bars, um, but it very much depends on your area of work. Um, but it's just things like, you know, you have to do your tax return um, you get no paid holiday, you get no paid sick leave. Um, but on the other hand, absolutely nobody can fire you. Um, so when I became a tenant, my former, one of my former pupil supervisors said, congratulations, you can now burn the place down and it requires a 70% vote in of the whole of Chambers to kick you out. Um, so there is, um, in some senses, a lot more security in being um, in the self-employed chamber structure. Um, but on the other hand, um, being self-employed, whilst it can be very flexible, does mean that you are relying very much more on yourself. Um, def forget about paid parental leave, um, that's not a thing. And um, depending on your chamber's policy, um, you'll just get to pay them less or no rent for a period of time. Um, but I think, I think chambers can, can be fantastic places. Um, and they are all very individual places. It's very difficult to get a sense of the specific culture of individual chambers um, without spending time in them. So mini pupillages are, I think, really important for that reason, as well as for deciding what area of law you might be interested in. Um, but, but having said that, it, you really need to have discussions, conversations with people um, who are at the bar, try and figure out um, what sort of lifestyle would suit you as well as um, what area of law you're interested in from a, a more intellectual point of view or um, subject matter interest. I'm rambling now, so I'll stop. Well, thank you to all of you for providing such an interesting answer. And it was particularly fascinating to hear from Emily that you were able to burn down chambers and no one could really stop you, basically. I think moving on slightly, it was definitely interesting to hear of your varied experiences and varied backgrounds. And I was just wondering, how did you all get to where you are now? Uh, especially if you could speak perhaps a little bit about maybe any extracurriculars that you did or any past work experience. I think particularly as a lot of our members are still considering the career and want to know how best to place themselves in a position to be able to approach the bar.
Um, I would suggest that the most important thing is advocacy experience of any kind, classically mooting yeah, when you're a law student or if you don't uh, study law at first when you do the conversion course, um, definitely do some mooting. Um, any other kind of legal volunteering work, so there's the free representation unit, law centres, um, when we are looking at applicants for pupillage, one of the main areas that we score people on um, is advocacy. And that doesn't have to be um, arguing a case. It could be non-legal advocacy. Think about the term quite creatively. You could be advocating for people um, in writing or orally in all sorts of different situations. But we want to see somebody has demonstrated that they have that skill and they have that potential. Um, aside from that, um, extracurriculars are great. It's interesting to have some nice soft questions to lob to people and things to remember people by because they've done something interesting um, and it shows some work-life balance. Um, but one thing that always impresses me when I look at applications is um, when under the job section, somebody um, has been working their way through university. Um, no pressure if you don't, I, I didn't. Um, but I, I, what I would say is don't worry if some of your contemporaries are doing um, wonderful unfunded volunteer work, you know, like you know, three months at a South African human rights organization. That's amazing that, that they can do it, but not everyone can afford to fund some of the really great extracurriculars that are out there. And I think um, we're all quite aware of that. Um, and uh, if you can show determination and hard work, that counts for an awful lot and um, just as much, if not more than a, a long list of extracurriculars. Um, I just wanted to pick up on something Emily said because um, I, I decided that I wanted to be a barrister quite late. And so I was left sort of trying to cram in relevant extracurricular experience on the law conversion course. Um, so I did mooting and I did mini pupillages and I'd done a vacation scheme beforehand, um, but, I agree with Emily that even if you have work experience that might seem irrelevant to you, that doesn't mean that it's going to be irrelevant to a recruitment committee looking at your application. Um, I got a part-time job while I was just in the university holidays um, at Ronnie Scott's Jazz Bar as a waitress, basically just by good luck. Um, and I think I was asked about that in every single pupillage interview that I did. Um, and I didn't think anybody would care about it at all at that stage. So anything that you can put on that shows you're working, you've got something to talk about, uh, I think is helpful. But obviously, the more that you can relate it to any of the skills that you might need, like you know, hard work, advocacy, experience is really useful. Yeah, so again, I can actually build on what um, Madeline and Emily say. Um, so I, I didn't study law at university. I was also a latecomer to the bar. Uh, so after I graduated university, I went, I worked in uh, banking for, for a bit and then I quit banking uh, and then I took a year out. And during that year out, I actually worked for a startup effectively doing cold calls all day, which was you know, as brutal as it sounds, not a very enjoyable job. However, it did give me something to talk about an interview about uh, non-legal advocacy experience. And, and actually getting on the phone with someone uh, who doesn't know you and doesn't know what you're trying to sell him and trying to sell him that product or her that product is, is and was a very useful advocacy experience. And it was something that I could talk about at length in interview. And so like Emily and Madden, I, I'd highly recommend looking at you know, interesting areas where you can get some advocacy experience. Sales is a great one. Um, I know most universities have uh, fundraising departments where you have to cold call people and, and ask for money. Um, it's a good way to earn a bit of money and it's also, it gives you something good to talk about in an interview. Um, sounds like a great way to prepare for a grumpy district judge. Yeah, no, exactly. There, there, there are definitely some parallels, yeah. Um, and... Again, like Madeline, I was forced to kind of cram everything into my uh, conversion course year, which was very stressful and it was very time consuming. Uh, and in terms of getting legal work experience, ideally, uh, you guys are doing the right thing by attending these sorts of events. Ideally, throughout university, you'd you know do 
perhaps a bit of work experience at a law firm and then perhaps you know do a mini pupillage somewhere and having both of those experiences allows you to kind of say you know this is why i want to be a barrister not a solicitor which is kind of an obvious pupillage interview question um and, and it also gives you some time to think about whether actually you're, you're interested in your legal career and I, i'd highly recommend getting that experience in as soon as possible if possible just to if i can just add on that um the one thing I would say, and hence example then is a really good one of something that actually will allow you to stand out um, on paper and in interview and be asked about something like cold calling people in a sales capacity. Because what you'll find when you get to doing the applications is that everybody who's applying has got the mini pupages, they may well have spent some time at solicitors offices. So really, what you need to be thinking about is what differentiates yourself from other people. And that can be, as Hank says, something like um, working in sales for a year um, it, but it can be anything it, it generally isn't that you want to be um, putting forward as what you want to be talking about um, during one interview I remember someone gave the best answer to the um, you know when have you dealt with a stressful situation question by saying she'd essentially run her own divorce um, she was a slightly more mature um, uh, applicant than otherwise and that you know floored the entire panel because we can all understand how legally that would have been challenging and how stressful that would have been personally. Um, and, you know, something like that can be far more impressive than, than the reams of many people that you've done. So, um, so think very carefully about um, what sets you apart. And I, I would say that when you do start doing uh, mini pupillages, moots, work experience, anything like that, uh, the thing you should do that I fail to do is um, keep a diary somewhere of it um, so that you include some details about what you did, but more importantly, what you think you can draw from it, what you might talk about if you were asked about it, um, if there's a particular case you came across um, that you observed, you know, pick up the judgment later on Bailey um, so that you can discuss it with a panel or think about what conclusions you drew about you know, a particular area of law or your, your career, the career you want. Because when you come to draft the forms in the end, you will have forgotten a lot of it. Um, and the forms that don't stand out are the ones that just list what people did. The forms that do stand out don't necessarily have um, any different content in terms of what people did, but um, they're the people who take the time to not just say, I, I did a mini pupillage at Temple Garden Chambers and I saw some interesting uh, personal injury work with so-and-so, but they explain what they drew from it um, and uh, what they thought about it. Um, and that shows somebody, because we're grading and all chambers are different, um, but probably quite similar. We're looking at advocacy, potential and experience. We're looking at intellect, um, which is mainly grades. Um, and we're looking at um, potential and interest and commitment to the bar. Um, and that's where you're going to be able to show that. And um, you're going to be able to show it, not just in the answers to specific questions on the form, um, but when you get the chance to list in detail and um, work experience and things like that. And um, so don't forget, write it down. <laughs> it would, would be my suggestion. Um, Emily, you provide a perfect bridge for me to um, follow up with the next question about how you specialized or how, how do you come about specializing in a certain area of the law because a lot of people will already be applying to the bar knowing where they want to be practicing uh, or in which area they want to be practicing and that most of the time um, people form those um, sort of aims for their career based off their mooting experience and what interested them when they studied law whether it was at, in undergrad or in their conversion um, so how did you and when did you um, decide what you would specialize in? So there is probably more chance at play than you might think before you start at the bar. I remember I did a mini pupillage and I asked somebody, how do you get into a particular area of law? And he said, um, well, you start out by knowing nothing at all about it and having no practice. You write a book in it, um, which is a classic way to get, get into an area. Um, but there's a lot of chance. So I do some extradition work now, and that is purely because um, we got some new members of chambers um, and bit by bit, this whole new little group um, developed as people joined us. And they came because they were junior members of the attorney general's panels. Um, but they also happen to be excellent extradition lawyers as, as their main practice. And they banded together and we've now got quite a, we've got one of the biggest, one of the top three extradition teams 
at the extradition bar. It's a small bar, um, but it's really fantastic. They're a lovely group of people. And so I started doing some of that work. I would never have anticipated when I applied for pupillages or when I joined Temple Gardens that I would end up doing that. Um, so there is a lot of chance. Um, bear in mind that when you study law, um, although it's a great subject in that it combines the intellectual and the vocational, and you, you have this interplay between the, the practicing lawyers and the academic lawyers, um, it is really different sometimes to practice in an area uh, and as opposed to study in an area. Um, and also bear in mind that, and certainly because we have a public law practice, a lot of people are interested in public law. We have some um, international criminal lawyers at our set. And so we get a huge amount of applicants who are all absolutely dedicated to human rights law and international law, which is fantastic. But um, they're one of many, 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 many people. Um, I didn't know exactly what area I wanted to do. I knew um, some areas I didn't want to do. I knew I didn't want to do crime um, for various reasons. One, because frankly, it's quite badly paid. And um, also from a work-life balance perspective. And I think some of the material is um, pretty, can really affect you. Um, family for similar reasons. I've never studied um, and it sounded a bit traumatic for me. Um, commercial, I'm not great with boxes and boxes and boxes of documents, and I wanted more independence. I didn't want to start out as the, the third, fourth or fifth junior. I'm exaggerating, but so I was quite open to a sort of mixed civil slash public practice. Um, and I applied to a huge range of chambers, which included, for some reason, a commercial set, a chancery set, um, a whole bunch of mixed civil public law sets. Um, and I ended up where I ended up because they offered me tenant, they offered me a pupillage um, and then offered me tenancy. So there's um, an element of luck in that. Um, I would say that one thing that in hindsight um, I did in my applications, which was probably quite a good idea, was to say not I'm interested in this area because this is what I've studied or I've done this moot or something and I, that this is all I want to do which would have been quite unrealistic. But to say at the moment, I've got a particular interest in X, Y, or Z that's been sparked by A, B, or C. But to say, I'm actually, I'm really open-minded about um, new areas of law and I'm looking forward to trying new and different things um, and developing, developing a practice. And I think that is, depending on the chambers you apply to and how specialized they are, if you're applying to a tax chambers, then that's probably not going to be a, a good approach to your application. Um, but if um, you're open-minded, uh, think about that and you can say that you don't have to and nobody expects you when um, you're at the stage of applying for pupillages to be ready to dedicate your life to um, one particular area of law um, and certainly at the start of your career um, you're probably again depending on the chambers not going to be doing that either and um, one QC once gave me a, the advice when I was a few years in and um, he said well what you've got to do is when you advertise yourself, you know, when you're writing a profile for the website, um, don't make yourself sound too narrow and specialised because you'll be shutting out opportunities. And um, don't make it sound like you do everything on earth because you'll sound like a jack of all trades. Um, and I think probably most of us um, start out really broad, willing to do almost anything um, because we can't say no to our clerks at the beginning. Um, and then we get more and more specialized as time goes on. And that's partly, I do certain areas because I knew I wanted to do them. So I told more senior members of chambers, I wanted to work with them um, and I would make myself available. And I do some areas um, purely through chance because I was available for a particular case or because certain colleagues joined chambers um, and, it, and it kind of snowballed from there. And um, so I, I, I've talked for a long time, but I just say be open-minded and, and bear in mind that if, if you're going to say you're dedicated to human rights, absolutely everybody is. I'd just say, um, I wouldn't demure from anything Emily said, but I think as the only person on the panel that's actually still in a common law set of chambers. Um, so as in common law, we do everything in chambers and are encouraged to do everything in chambers. Um, and that goes right from top to bottom. So my head of chambers, who's a silk, uh, maybe not last year because of COVID, but um, you know, I think in the last couple of years has done a case in the, in the Supreme Court on family law, did one last year in relation to um, the regulation of food and things like that. So it is possible to maintain a breadth of practice throughout your career. It's just very unusual these days to do that. Um, in terms of sort of a broad structure and cheese and specialism, someone gave me the, the advice, no matter where you end up, do everything that you can for the first five years because it'll give you that breadth of experience. 
from five to ten start trying to work out what you think your specialism might be from five to or ten to fifteen um, really start narrowing that down and then from then on making sure you're the best person at the bar in that area um, that advice I think seems to hold pretty pretty well for, for everyone at the bar no matter what they do um, but a word on, on common or briefly because um, I would say this being at a common or set and biased but I do think there are some significant advantages to thinking about that as a route um, would be my proposal that there is no better preparation for any career at the bar than exposing yourself to as many different areas at the beginning as possible. Um, I will treasure and never forget making my first um, jury speech, you know, during my second six pupillage, um, defending somebody accused of a crime. That, to me, will stay as one of the pinnacles of my career um, in that way. Um, it also, being a common law set, gives you exposure to work that you might not expect to do. Um, I was a junior on a murder trial for six weeks in Oxford. I'm also um, helping Emily out on the Grenfell inquiry. Um, uh, last week, I did something in Belfast. I had a contested probate matter going on. So if you want that variety, um, because you're not quite sure what you want to do, because you didn't study law and there wasn't something that really interested you. Um, I did philosophy and classics, actually, um, in similar sort of vein to Madeline then uh, a common law set is a great example of somewhere that you can really um, experience everything and then work out what you want to do from there. Um, I'm going to give a sort of opposite perspective as somebody who started out at a set um, that is more of a specialist set, although I do most of the work that is available within my set. Um, I do agree with Emily that it, it is partly chance. The, the way that I came to want to do commercial chancery was um, firstly that matched up with the areas that I enjoyed academically on the law conversion course so when I was doing the law conversion course um, I really enjoyed equity and trusts contract and land law um, I then did mini pupillages at quite a wide range of sets. So I did a few in commercial chancery sets, but I also did um, a family mini pupillage. Um, I did sort of more general common law mini pupillages and that confirmed my decision. So those were the steps that I took. Um, that said, the type of work that I do now is actually very different from anything that I studied on the law conversion course. Um, Emily's completely right that there's a huge difference between studying a subject academically and practicing in it. Um, so I, I still do property work, but I think that was my favorite subject on the GDL and it's probably my least favorite part of practice now, partly because it involves massive amount of landlord and tenant law which I didn't study on the GDL and which it turns out that I hate. Um, and I now do loads of insolvency, which I never studied at any point before I started practice. Um, so it's very good luck in some ways that I turn out to enjoy commercial chancery because although I took, I think all of the reasonable steps that I could have taken to decide that I wanted to do a relatively specialist area, it, it could have worked out badly. Um, that said, and I, I know we don't have loads of time, so I'll try to make this quite quick. Um, I think there are advantages um, to joining a more specialist set earlier, uh, which is that I think you can get a real feel for a particular area of law. Um, so taking insolvency as an example, it's I don't think it's an area that you can very easily kind of dabble in. I think there's a massive advantage to doing a lot of it, knowing it kind of inside out. Um, I think that does give you a real head start in practice. And I would say the same for sort of other areas that I do now. So if you are fairly confident early on that you do want a relatively specialised sort of practice, then go for it. But I can also see there's a huge amount of wisdom in what Mark and Emily have said. Yeah, so um, I pretty much agree with everything that was just said. My, my process was fairly random and, and haphazard, to be quite frank. Um, 
I can't honestly say that I, I massively enjoyed the GDO. It did get, get better, and I really enjoyed pupillage, and I'm really enjoying my job now. But I didn't particularly enjoy the GDL that much. I think that's probably because how it's taught. Um, the, the, I found mini pupillages to be the, the most helpful way of narrowing down the areas that I wanted to work within. And for example, I did a mini pupillage at a crime set, and within the first day, I knew that this probably wasn't wasn't for me. And then I did a mini pupillage at a civil common law set and a, and a commercial set, and I enjoyed that work much more. Um, and so it was clear from that that you know civil common law and, and commercial sets were the sets I was going to be applying to. Uh, I, I can't say I had a specific area of law in mind when I applied for people. It was very much a scattergun approach, to, to, to be honest. Um, I applied to a wide range. Like Mark, I, I wanted to ensure that I was exposed to a wide range of law at an early phase of my career. Uh, and so I applied to sets that, that had kind of civil common law specialism. So sets like One Chancery Lane or um, Temple Garden Chambers or um, other sets like that. And it, fortunately, I have been exposed to a wide range of work uh, and I am hopefully going to be able to pick out a specialism over, over the next three or four years uh, and hopefully I'll enjoy that specialism. I think that um, depending on if you were able to get a short list of the sort of areas you think you might be interested in, and so you can look at the subjects that you're doing, you can look uh, at something like uh, the Legal 500 or Chambers and Partners and just look down their practice areas, although they're a bit commercial biased, so you'll get more detail uh, in the commercial areas. And, and sort of shortlist areas, target them with mini pupillages, talk to people working at the bar, especially people who are quite junior, who can give you that sort of first five years, what's it really going to be like? You can get a sense of practically what they're like to practice in um, and whether they're the sorts of areas um, like perhaps Hank, Mark and I, you know, I benefited from, I love torts and I benefited from doing um, PI and then every weird and wonderful tort because my clerks knew that the odd of the case, um, if it was a really weird area of law, Emily would do it at the beginning of my career, which served me quite well. Um, and actually you would be surprised how often um, interesting torts turn up in public law cases and in JR claims. Um, and you have all sorts of interesting um, false imprisonment and misfeasance and all kinds of things going on. Um, but yes, if, if you if you shortlist the areas you might be interested in, you, you can find out whether it's, it's an area of practice, perhaps like Madeleine's or maybe tax um, or um, I don't know, perhaps employment always seems to me to be an area where you I dabble, I used to dabble a tiny bit and I probably shouldn't because it's quite, it feels to me like quite a specialist area where you might really want to focus, have a more focused practice um, and you can look at different chambers and you can look at the profiles of people, you can look at what areas of law they do and you can see what areas of law tend to go together within a chambers and which chambers are more focused um, and which have a broader um, set uh, of practice areas and you can get an idea like that. Basically you need to just spend a do a lot of research and um, there's a huge amount of information out there in if you just google um for guides to, to getting into the bar and um, but you can get a lot from chambers websites as well and people's profiles as long as you bear in mind that and um, that is us trying to advertise to clients as well um, so uh, the classic mistake is for um, uh, people at a chambers to really want to develop their practice in a particular area, really talk it up in their practice area section on the website. Um, and then some poor applicants will apply saying, you know, I, I'm, I'm really interested in, you know, Temple Garden Chambers, wonderful clinical negligence practice. We do have some clinical negligence work, but it's really not one of the main areas. And, and if your entire application is centered around clin neg, um, then unfortunately we'll realize that you read the practice area section, but you didn't really look at individual profiles and cases people listed and our news items and see what work we're actually doing. Um, so research, 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 and I totally agree that minis are the best way. I know someone said in the questions about the impacts of COVID, I think we've tried to do some virtual mini pupillages, um, but cross fingers by hopefully by the summer, we might be starting to get back to normal. Great, and thank you all for mentioning just the element of chance, but also how you decide to go into the areas that you decided. And I think in doing so, you've basically answered a lot 
about what I was going to ask as the final question, which is how you chose the set of chambers that you were now at. So I think um, keeping an eye on time and looking at how many audience questions that we have, uh, we will go straight on to those now. So the first one that was a pre-submitted question was how would you say the work-life balance differs between being a barrister and a solicitor? I'll take that one. Um, I think it can depend uh, what you do in either job. So if you're an employed barrister, I suspect your work-life balance is probably quite a lot better than self-employed barristers. Um, although that's probably not um, a hard and fast rule. And similarly with solicitors, if you're in private practice, um, probably your work-life balance is um, worse than if you're in-house, for example. Um, but generally, I think, you know, if you want to be a solicitor at a, a magic circle, a silver circle firm, you're going to work just as hard as you are as a, as a barrister um, in self-employed practice. Um, the hours, I'm afraid, are, are pretty long in both professions, as far as I'm, I'm aware. You've got to know that going into the job, I'm afraid. Mm, yeah, I, I'd agree with that. I, I've got friends who work at city law firms, um, and I work at least as hard as them, if, if not slightly longer. Um, sorry, not harder. I work at least as long as them, if not longer. And um, that's certainly been my experience in the past, in the first four months. Maybe that will get better as time goes on and it gets slightly more efficient at, at doing this sort of work. But certainly during pupillage in the first four months of my tenancy, uh, the hours have been fairly long and I, and I think you can expect to work long hours in whichever area you choose to work in. Um, I would say that um, if you if I compare myself and everyone in Chambers, um, people have different um, preferences about how much they want to work, which is related to, you know, personality, which is related to, you know, what's going on in their lives that year and um, any sort of career goals they've got. Um, and I think the idea is that you have the choice. There are some people who definitely work the sorts of hours you get in um, magic circle firms. Although having known people who do that job, I would say the difference at the bar is that if you're working, you're working. And if you're working, you're billing. Um, whereas at a law firm, you may well, depending on the area, find yourself spending hours in the evening waiting for the partner to finish something else and get back to you on the draft that needs to go out tonight. Um, I'm sure there are lots of other benefits to working at a law firm. I'm clearly prejudiced. Um, but I think the benefit is if I'm working late, it's because that's the way um, I've organised um, it. I've taken on enough work um, that month or week or whatever um, to keep me working. Um, and, you know, maybe it's because I, I went for a really long coffee with a friend in the morning um, and I decided I'd rather work in the evening to accommodate that. Um, the work-life balance is to some extent flexible. Um, and I think that's one of the real appeals of the bar. Um, and there will some people who work incredibly hard and, and some people who enjoy the fact that you can do other things as well. I agree. I, I don't have very much to add. Um, I would only say, I think um, Emily's right about sort of control. I found my, my first two years, um, frankly, I was utterly miserable. Uh, I was working six days a week at least um, all the time and very long hours during the week and I think that was partly because I was much slower because I every, every single thing you do is new at the beginning of practice so everything takes you an extremely long time and you're terrified about getting things wrong um, and I also hadn't really realized that I could tell the clerks when I was too busy and I was overwhelmed um, and I also think that when you're very, very junior, frankly, I love my clerks, but I don't think they listen to you as much when you say you're too busy. Um, I am much better now at saying no when I'm genuinely too busy and I can't take anything on. And they also listen to me when I say that. So you do have some control over it. Not always because, you know, sometimes you've committed to cases and you know, you might have a few ongoing cases and they all blow up at the same time and, and something needs to be done on all of them and then it can be stressful, but they're your cases. So it doesn't feel as bad as if you were sort of working for someone else or not to me at least. And you definitely don't feel like you're being taken advantage of. Someone in the comments asked about work-life balance, which um, area of the bar is best for that? Um, 
I don't think I could answer that question. Um, but what I would say is that perhaps one of the reasons, one of the reasons why the work-life balance in crime, I think is probably more difficult is because if a trial overruns, there's um, much more impetus to finish the trial. You could leave a civil case potentially halfway through for six months and people could pick up their notes but nobody's liberty is at stake but also crime is um much less well paid so you have to do more work to earn a living um, and i think it's really worth bearing in mind um what is the funding situation in the area of law you're considering is it legal aid that that um has been cut a lot um, is it um, employment um, the that work has gone up and down depending on employment tribunal fees um, is it you know my area is um, government I'm paid by the government because I work for them so the fees are, are not high um, but the the pay is paid regularly and on time and um, extradition cases uh, tend to get paid at the very end of the lifetime of the case which could be a year or two or more and um, so your work life balance might depend on how much you have to work to fund the rest of your life, um, which is something that I think often just doesn't occur to you necessarily um, when you're starting out and um, looking at the bar. Um, I think, oh, sorry, oh, you go on. I'll, I'll let you um, finish the thought, Madeline. Thank you. All, all I was going to say is that in terms of work life balance, it, it does also depend on your own personality and what type of work you find stressful. So I don't tend to enjoy last minute work, um, you know, which comes in, you know, papers come in and there for a trial the next day, or, you know, I think for some criminal barristers, you're getting papers on the morning of your hearing. Um, I would have a nervous breakdown within about five minutes if I had to operate like that. But I think some people find it really exciting. Um, on kind of the other end of the scale, if you're at a commercial set, you might be doing sort of 10 week trials, 12 week trials, you know, trials that run on for months and months and months. And that is going to be very, very long hours over a very consistent period of time. Um, followed possibly when you finish that trial by no work because your diary will have been blocked out for you to do that trial it probably won't be filling up with other things that are coming after it in case the trial overruns um, so you might have sort of much longer periods where you're working very long hours followed by sort of fallow periods um, and if that is the kind of lifestyle that you're going to find sort of difficult to handle because it's sort of uncertainty and it's kind of not consistent, then that's something to bear in mind as well. Um, uh, I think we only have time for one more question. And so I'll do one which is a catch all for um, a common theme that's been running throughout um, the past hour and that's the um, challenges, well, let's, let's be a bit more positive, the advantages of um, doing a non-law uh, undergrad um, and the differences in the approach which you might have to take in terms of applications and experience um, as you apply to, to the bar. Um, Mark, we haven't heard from, oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, Mark, I haven't heard from you, so maybe since you since you didn't do a law undergrad, we could uh, start with you. Um, as, I, as I said earlier, I would anticipate that by the time you get to applying, you're going to have similar things on your CV to to everyone else. Um, I know that the question was posed in the the chat as to um, is there any stigma from doing an online conversion course. I have to say, not not that I would be aware of. It certainly isn't something that if I were reviewing somebody's form, I would be concerned to see. Um, I did my undergraduate degree at Warwick and then did the law conversion course in Plymouth, where I'm from, because I think it was about £5,000 cheaper to do it in Plymouth than anywhere else. And I can do it at home. So I saved money on that as well. Um, realistically, what certainly in my chambers where we want to see is that you've got a law degree one way or the other. Um, and everything else should have said follow follow from that i would say um actually one thing that emily did say was moot when you are doing your 
um, law degree or conversion course, I actually did some mooting while I was doing my undergraduate non-law degree. Um, I can't say that I think it put me at a particular disadvantage because much as people have said, you will do things in practice that you've never studied before. And so I don't think there's any disadvantage to doing some mooting um, before you've actually done your law degree. And um, I did a law degree, but I think when I applied, I remember seeing some statistic that about 50% or close to 50% of people had done a non-law degree. So it's not unusual. You're not in, in a minority, or if you are, it's, it's not a very small minority. Um, and when I look at applications, um, I it's, it's perfectly nice. It's nice to see someone who's done something else um, because a law degree is, is not the same thing as um, legal practice. It's not gonna put you at any particular disadvantage. Um, and people come to the bar with um, not only non-law degrees, but entire different careers. And we have, I think, someone who's been in the army, someone who works in trading standards, someone who was an opera singer, all kinds of um, people end up, in, up, up at the bar. And you don't need to do the classic route, which I did, of um, law degree or degrees um, and then the bar course. I, I, I have nothing really to, to add to that, to be honest. Um, I think that's probably spot on. I think so as well. Um, I didn't do a law degree. I didn't think that it was a disadvantage at all. Um, I think the only way in which it was a possible disadvantage was just the kind of trying to cram your extracurricular activities and your studies into one year of the conversion course. But if you plan better than I did, you don't have to do that. Um, and I am now on our recruitment committee and um, certainly all of us on the committee, when we see applications, um, we don't mind whether someone's got a law degree or whether they've done something else as long as they've got the qualifications that they need. Just to pick up um, one other question that has been posed in the chat, because I know that it's six o'clock now um, and I hope the other panelists won't mind, but the question's been posed as to what is diversity like, especially with disabled students. I think it's probably important that we try and we do try and address that question if possible. Um, it, it's not good, frankly. Um, that is in part because there are so few applicants with disabilities, I would, would suggest, but I think that's because they're being put off at an early stage. So what I would say is to anyone who's listening who is concerned about that, please don't be put off. Um, Chambers will do everything possible to make reasonable adjustments um, where, where at all possible. It can be very difficult. Um, I don't have a disability and I can only imagine how difficult it would be at times to be a self-employed barrister with that. Um, for example, my chambers is a, I think in a 17th century building, there is no wheelchair access and there's very little that chambers can do about that. It's a grade one listed building. Um, but please don't be put off. Um, chambers will do everything they can to, uh, to accommodate people. Um, so anyone listening, please do bear that in mind. And I, I would add, um, I think our, our chambers, because we have a big PI practice, so a lot of our clients might be disabled. Um, when quite a while ago um, there was a refurbishment, um, we made sure everything was accessible on the ground floor at least, um, and we have a lift, so we would be able to accommodate somebody. Um, but depending on the area of law, um, if it's a physical disability, you might find it quite demanding to do, for example, a junior PI practice when you're expected to go to county courts all over London, the southeast, the country, taking trains and um, getting there early in the morning um, and and so if there are difficulties with trains you might end up in difficulty um, and a variety of crumbling court buildings um, in far-flung locations and um, so it might affect the area of law that practically you might want you might think well do I want to put myself through this or not um, I think as a chambers we've had disabled applicants before or people with non-physical disabilities and we're extremely open to that um, because it's a self-employed area and people make all sorts of adjustments for you know the children in their lives or family members they have to care for or um, the sabbath or all sorts of things people organize their practices around um, and a disability should be no different to that and um, my advice might be that um, the inns of court might be a good resource we have lots of um, mentoring schemes and things like that but we have great student officers in the inns of court uh, mine is Middle Temple, um, and they're probably the best people to put you in touch with the right people to talk to. Um, and that would be my stock answer. 
um, to a lot of the questions in the chat, especially about mini pupillages. There's a lot of information online. Go read the Chambers websites, Google mini pupillages. You'll find lots of articles of advice. You'll find Chambers explaining, different Chambers take different approaches about when they will accept applications for mini pupillages and when they suggest them. Some are assessed, some are not assessed, but you'll find that all out online. And, and use resources um, like your university's bar society, um, but also um, look at the inns of court and the events that they're putting on for students and the opportunities they offer. And um, because there are lots of people out there who are willing to help and offer advice. And funding, the inns offer funding, don't forget. Great, so thank you again to all of our panellists for all of your insight and everything you have said tonight. I found it really helpful and I'm sure many of our members did as well. So we really do appreciate your time. And thank you to everyone who has attended. We hope you did enjoy the session. We have recorded a session, so it will be made available afterwards if you found out there was a particular bit you wanted to recap on. And also just being a little bit cheeky, but I'm going to plug a bar stock event as well, because later on this week, on Thursday, we actually have another panel coming up, which is specifically on making pupillage applications. And I know there were a couple of questions in the chat regarding that, which we weren't able to completely address. So do come up to that. And thank you again to everyone and enjoy the rest of your evening. Safina. Yeah, thanks very much for having us, Fina. Yes, thank, thank you for having us. And Alex as well, actually. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Thank you.